you requested him. We got him. One of our most requested guests are in the house, as well as Facebook winners and prize winners and avid winners and all kinds of stuff. You're at the place, Pensado's Place. One of the great joys in life is sitting here watching Herb do that. That's great, Herb. Thank you. You do that so well. <laughs> it's my only function on the job. So I prepare all week and then do that in 10 seconds. All that rehearsing in front of a mirror pays off. I'm telling you something. No, I'm serious, man. You do that good. I, 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 wish I, could, I wish I could do that. But I can't. Good to have you guys. Great to see you. And uh, it's been a fun week. I got a little rest this week. Uh, massive change in medication, so better living through chemistry and all that. Um, these are legal, not illegal, by the way. Just have to clarify that. Yeah. Drugs are bad. And uh, it's going to be a great show. Um, you know what? I'm so excited. I'm not going to talk today, Herb. You want to make a note of this? Let's get, let's, get all the, let's get all the stuff out of the way and get right to the good stuff. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. So um, welcome, everybody. It's good to see you. I hope it's, hope it's good to see us. Uh, let's say hello to our Vintage King friends. Hi, Vintage King. Uh, I think in our chat room, in our corner office, is our guy, Ryan McGuire. There's Ryan's page. It's sitting up there. Ryan. And um, you have a, do you have a, you know, you've had a challenge for the last two weeks for the people in the, in it for our vintage king people. Do you have uh, a, I do, and I forgot it. Give me a second. I'll come back to Ryan. All right. We'll do that. Uh, but anyways, always a uh, big, big hello to those folks and uh, get in the chat room. Um, and then we've had this contest going on for a while now. Here's our Pro Tools 10. It's our Vanna White moment right here. 699 bundle. I think this is the, is this the last week? We've had three winners to date. And so. I couldn't even tell you what month it is, much less how many we've given away. So here's the big challenge of this, this announcement, which is going to put some pressure on you. Drew's not here, so we need a drum roll. So I need you to knock it out. I, I don't have full use of the left side of my body. <laughs> Ooh. That was horrible. Wow. <laughs> No offense to our... I got medical excuses, guys. Give me a damn break. Anyways, it, that, <laughs> that drum roll does not negate at all the fact that you're going to do great stuff with this new Pro Tools 10 bundle. And the winner from North Yorkshire is Dominic Armstrong. Dominic. All right, congratulations. <laughs> I'm going with practice. So, uh... We are, we are excited for you, and uh, congratulations that. Enter next week. I think, uh, I think, we're, I think it, I have to determine how much longer the contest is running. But anyways, the way you enter is you enter at pensadosplace.tv forward slash avid. Um, you know how to do it. There it is up on the screen. You can make sure that you can enter. You see it right below. Um, thanks to our friends at Avid for uh, pulling that together and as usual you know where to contact us all the normal places that's Facebook and Twitter and um, YouTube and before we go to the ITL now Dave has the question I for forgot, Ryan I forgot, McGuire I forgot what it was but ask Ryan is it better to leave your equipment on all the time or turn it off at each night so just just to reiterate please restate that should you leave your gear on all the time, which is what I do, or turn it off each night? That question is for Ryan McGuire in our chat room from Vintage King. So, that said, why don't you intro ITL? we got stuff to get to this week, and let's Man, get to it. Uh, ITL this week, self-explanatory. Are, are you ready to run it? Well, that's a short intro. I might have caught you off guard. Guys, I, I was, uh, like I always do... I, Sneaking around gear sluts, um, uh, I'm, I'm over there a lot checking stuff out, and I was just cruising through some general questions, and I noticed that a lot of people kept asking about, um, do I put the EQ before the compressor, do I put it after the compressor? We went over this a couple of times, but um, I'm going I'm to give you a little different take on it. Um, but philosophically, I like to clean up the signal before it gets to the compressor. Um, so, for example, if I've got a lot of low end in a particular sound, I like to take that out so it doesn't control the compressor too much. Uh, if I've got various things that, that are peaking and I, I want the compressor to work a little smoother, different things. So I, anything I put before the compressor is repair work for the compressor to do a better job, give me the sound I want. Anything after I do, any EQing after the compressor, um, I tend to think of it as compensating for things that the compressor lacked. 
and then sometimes uh, I just like the sound of it. So, as always, trust your ears, but I'm going to change that little saying, experiment, 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 and then trust your ears. You're going to do some stuff that sounds bad, but remember it because there's a place for it somewhere in the, in the recording world. And once you get a catalog of how things um, sound in your head, then then that uh, increases your palate that you can draw from. So some of these aren't exactly fitting the, the title, some of these examples, but heck, I just want to show them to you anyway. It's kind of cool to me. And we're, we're using the song uh, Monsters again. Uh, I love this song. Okay, uh, here's a track with no vocals, just so you can hear it. I want you to focus on the drums, the ambient drum sound. Okay, now I'm going to solo this particular ambient track. Okay, I'm, I'm put this double lock on it, which basically this double lock is a compressor. Uh, gosh, it must be from the 50s, maybe. Um, I got hip to it by uh, hearing that Chad Blake used it. It's, um, it was designed kind of like an AGC, an automatic gain control. It was supposed to just kind of keep a, a, a speaker in your face, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an MC or something in your face, a speaker. And um, it just distorts really nice. It was so crappy, so check this out. Okay, as you can see, we gained a lot, but we, we, we got a bunch of crap, so let's clear that crap out. I want it to be a little more ambient sounding. Okay, so let's put that in the track. Now let's see what happens if we put like like the, the low end EQ above the before the compressor. I'm not gonna say one's better than the other, but you can hear the difference in the sound, so you know, check that out. I live for this stuff. That was so cool. Okay, let me show you let me show you something similar on a hi hat track. This is a little different. I think you're going to like this. Might give you some ideas. Um, DS run the hi hat. Dave, have you lost your mind? Well, that's, an, that's another ITL. A, a DS is just a compressor where the side chain is just feeding at certain frequencies. So uh, usually they're thought of as being good for high end. The hi hat is high end. So let's check it out. Without the deesser, here's without the EQ. Now here's here's with the EQ DS. Takes a little bit of that brittleness out of it. Now let's put the let's reverse it. I like it better. I like it better with the EQ after the compressor. Let's do it in the track. Just kind of brings the. Brings it a little bit in your face. Is that, is that dramatic enough, Will? Okay. Now, let me show you a kick drum. I'm taking a chance because I'm doing this just off the, off the top of my head. This, uh, this could sound worse or better. I don't know. Um, this is a, I showed you this plug in before. This is emulating the parameters on a DBX160 XT. Let's solo this kick. This is with the stuff on it. Without, with, 
Okay, let's do it in the track. Now, now let's see what happens if we um, if we put the compressor after the EQ. Before. I like the low end better. I like a lot about it better. Okay, now let's try something else. Let's try a bass. This ought to this ought to be fun. Sometimes, guys, these are these these examples are a little on the subtle side, mainly because I'm I'm actually giving you stuff from a mix, and you know, mixing is not about exaggerating. It's about a lot of little tiny moves. Okay, so here's the bass. Without it. the compressor first, then the EQ. Now the compressor is just doing basic stuff. Uh, no compression on this channel strip. I probably tried it and didn't like it, so uh, the compressor that is, just kept the EQ. Uh, nothing radical on the EQ, just a little top end, a little mid-range, I guess. It's in the track. Uh, let's see what it sounds like with the compressor before the EQ. After. Very subtle, but I like it better after. Let's, sit, let's listen to it in the mix, see what, what happens. Okay, in the mix compressor before the EQ. Not sitting quite right. It's a little muddier. I don't hear the definition of the of the, the strings. It just sounds better to me like this. It's subtle. If if um, if it's if it's something that you don't readily hear, um, don't feel bad. Some of these things are subtle. Um, but like I said, it's the combination of a lot of little subtle things. Let's see, we did the kick, we did the hat, ambience, and the bass. Damn, I think that was it. Hope you liked it. Very cool ITL, my friend. <laughs> yes. um, you know, one of the things that I just wanted to mention um, that the audience, I'm sure, appreciates is just how much work goes into booking guests and how cool our guests have been to come share with the audience. It says a lot about how they feel about you, which is reality, because it comes out of your Rolodex, and it says a lot about how they feel about our audience. And so uh, pulling, pulling this guy was a special. He actually canceled something yeah. to be with us, as long as we could pre-tape him early this morning, which, yeah. which we had a great time with him. Why don't you introduce oh. our, our well, we just got guest. through. We just got through talking to Bob Power. He's, he's someone that's very dear and important to my career, important to me as a human, and important to the world, especially the world of music. And uh, it was a great interview. Um, I want to thank Bob for, he actually canceled a class herb, I think. I don't, right. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. Very cool. To, to, at, at NYU. He teaches at NYU, and he, right now as we speak, he's actually teaching a course. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the course is about Pensada's place and all, you know. Unless you're watching this <laughs> Sunday, Sunday <laughs> afternoon at 3 o'clock, he's not teaching that. No, I, I made that up about this teach this. But I tell you what, guys, um, this is, one, this is, this is a, a very special day for me, a very special moment. I say that a lot, but this, this, is, this guy is incredible. So enjoy the Bob Power interview. Here it comes. So, Bob, it's great to have you here, man. I can't thank you enough. I know you've got a million things to do, and, and, and I appreciate you, you making it a million and one today for, for our audience. You've got much, much love in our community and that, that we've kind of assembled here. You're, you're someone that probably has been requested more than anyone. 
Um, one of the things that, that, that I'm envious about, uh, not envious isn't the right word, proud isn't the right word, I, I, I don't have the right word at the moment, but hip hop kind of had different incarnations or waves, if you will. And the first wave, you know, was obviously the first wave, but you kind of defined the second wave single-handedly with your work with Tribe and with Dela and uh, D'Angelo and Erica Badu. I mean, um, at the at the time you were working on this stuff, did you know that that, that it was that important, that special, that unique? No, <clears throat> no, and that's a funny question because people often say, "Wow, did you know you were making a classic?" It's like mm -hmm. you know exactly like me. You're in the studio, you're yeah. working, trying to do the best you can, and you try to get some sleep. <laughs> yeah, that's true. When I, uh, you, you remind me a lot of Richard Wolf from Wolf and Epic because Richard is um, has has a. Uh, um, a broad-based knowledge of music that wasn't just self-taught, but from a number of sources, and you you follow that pattern too, in, in the sense that that that, that you've, you've learned from a number of different ways, it, it, and and the the formal part of your learning, how did that amplify or conflict with with the hip hop world? Because the hip hop world is built on imperfections, which you've managed to turn into perfections, and the other world that you and Richard used to be in for a while is built on perfection. How did you work that together? Well, first of all, it's important to remember that uh, all the really cool records and great records I've worked on were not that way because of me. They were that way because it was an artist with something unique, very special, very unique to say, and a unique way of saying it. Um, you know, I tried to make sure that certain things didn't get in the way. Um, I feel really blessed that my career in music has taken me so many different places. A couple of things. Number one, I get bored easily. You know, a lot of times in my career I've done something for seven, eight years, kind of hit the level that I wanted to hit, and then something else, oddly, I wasn't looking for it, but engineering, I backed into engineering. Something else came along, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. I need to know more about this. Mm -hmm. So between you know all my various careers, scoring television, doing jingles, being a player for a living for a long time, um, a traditional classical music education, which is really weird, because that was not planned either. I just didn't know what else to do in college. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all the way down to engineering and getting exposed to a lot of different kinds of music through that. And you know, as a player as well, mm -hmm. every day it's a different gig. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you're, you're, you're known for, for incredibly massive low end. Uh, there was a time during the part of my career when I was doing live music where we felt that if we could get a three cycle tone pumped into the audience it would force a bowel movement by a mass majority of I've the audience. So. Have you ever noticed that you've got so much low end on your records that there's an increase in sales of, uh, <laughs> of, of medicines keeping people from going to excessive bowel movements? <laughs> no, but you know. I mean, maybe you should think about endorsing a, a product like that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I actually do love about the extended part of low end, say from 90, 95 on down, is that you know this, it actually shakes the cuffs of your pants. <laughs> Often if you turn something up and if the real low end is right, your, pan, your pants cuffs are sort of shuffling around. I never knew that you could work down there until I heard low end theory. Uh, I, I, I used to try, I used to think I had low end, but I didn't realize that there was a whole nother octave and a half, possibly two octaves that you work with that I had missed completely. Was that just a function of your taste? I mean, did you always hear music that way or were you guided no. that way by some of your clients and then refined it yourself? Certainly guided by my clients. I mean, this was hip hop, you know, and uh, particularly back then, whoever had the biggest low end had the biggest fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, no, wonder. no wonder. I never, I didn't, 
you know, that was a big learning period for me. And I wasn't thinking, okay, you got to work the octave between 95 and, and 80 and then get something else happening down at 45. I have a funny thing about mixing. Remember Star Trek? They had the prime directive where mm -hmm. basically don't change the destiny of the people you're going to see. Right. My prime directive in mixing is can I hear in everything? I mean, it's really simple, but I, I want to hear everything. And I as you know, often suffer under the assumption that an artist or a producer put something on the track because <laughs> they want to hear it, and in truth, they just keep throwing stuff at it, and it's our job to sort through it. Yeah. The, uh, uh, I, I still can't get out of my brain the conflict between the precision of a classical background and, and the, the, the rub, like you call it, of, of the hip-hop world. Let me, let me tell you, man, I, you know, I remember the night, a hot August night when I was 17, and I didn't know, you know, I, I knew the school I had gotten into, and I didn't know what to do with myself, and I saw that to be a music major, there was a classical conservatory at the school, you needed, like, ridiculous, like, 85% of your credit hours had to be in music, so I had to start right away. So I walked in my dad's room, and my dad was, was pretty liberal with me, but I said, Dad, you know, I think I'm going to be a music maker, I mean, a uh, music major. Mm. Uh, the caca hit the fan, and um, <laughs> still, what happened was I ended up going to a school, you got to remember this is 1970, and it was pure sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I was playing in rock bands, I was playing the Chitlin circuit at night, and I just looked around. I was a classical composition major. I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, I just looked around and I thought, you know what? These other people are doing it. They're, they're no, not necessarily any smarter than you are. They've just been playing classical piano since they were four. <laughs> so my distaste for failure actually got me through. Wow. That's so cool. Herb, you want to explain to our viewers that don't know, you want to explain the Chitlin circuit? Well, why would I know more about that than you? <laughs> because you've been quiet, and I'm giving you an opportunity to talk. Cause you ain't going to get a word in between well, me and Bob well, unless no, I I'm, give you something. I'm still trying. As to... it came out of my mouth, I knew it, I knew that was going to be pursued. No, no. That actually, way. I was still trying to work through that. You asked. You almost got an, em, an emodium endorsement. <laughs> <from Bob. laughs> I'm still back there. Bob, that's true, isn't it? Three, three, they, we thought that back. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer mm -hmm. came up with this concept that if, if you took a synthesizer and put three cycle tone, not 3K, but it's, you can't hear it. Right. And they would, they would count the number of people that left the concert to run to the bathroom. Mm. And mm. I and know that his records make people the go to the bathroom. the Army getting in on this and the Army taking these big speakers out onto the battlefield so the enemy all poops in their pants at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the Chitlin Circuit thing, you know, traditionally, actually, the Chitlin Circuit in the South mm -hmm. was a series of roadhouses. Right. Yeah, I and played that circuit. It was what really was R&B, which was like jump music. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I did a circuit of black clubs around St. Louis, so I call it the Chitlin Circuit. Mm -hmm. I will say that... Uh, many of the times we'd get to where we were going for the gig and there'd be a sheriff's notice pinned to the door because somebody got shot the night before. So it wasn't uh, all peaches and cream. There's no. kind of a revival of roadhouses now around Oh, it the still South. exists. The Chitlin yeah, Circus yeah, still yeah. exists and people still play it. And some of the greatest music ever is, is Chitlin Circus. Yeah. yeah. Bob, explain to me, because... a. a Engineers are technical people, and, and we have a tendency to want to do too much. Sometimes we want to. Um, I've been known to, to, to spend four hours on a hi hat part, not necessarily because I wanted to, but partly because the client was beautiful, lovely, and it was the right thing to do at the moment. But you, you, you have a philosophy, just don't get hung up on the details, and, and, and you have a way of working that, that you describe somewhat as concentric. Can you, can you expand on that? Because I think it's important for our audience to know that mixing is not start at point A and get to point B. It's, a, it's, like, it's like a sculpture. You knock off the big pieces first, and then you start getting the face to emerge, and then the hands, and that. I answered your question, but if you can... Well, no, you didn't, actually, because I used to be... Because I'm self-taught, I was horrible. You know, I'd spend four hours on the kick drum. I'm like, okay, well, that's about right. <laughs> then get on the snare. And then, you know, uh, a year and a half later, it wasn't quite like that. But um, one of the things about doing something for a long time is you have to start, if you're intelligent, 
in the way you look at yourself and your craft, mm -hmm. you have to start managing your creativity. That's a place where I feel like I'm at in my career. You know, I can only get better in due time. You know, you try to get better every time you do something. But uh, in terms of managing my creativity, and digital has had a huge amount to do with this, uh, I feel like it's best for me and sometimes for other people to work in concentric circles where you make one pass through a track where you say, okay, and this might take me a couple hours where I say, okay, it, it, you know, I can almost hear everything. It's not really horrible. And then you start circling around again. Um, one of the ways in which I keep fresh is when I take breaks, I'll come back, I have a pad of paper, I hit play, I don't stop playback to fix stuff. I just hit play and write down everything that comes to my mind that I don't like, and then I work my way down the list. And then it's like three hours later, and I do the same thing all over again. God, that is so weird, because I'm self-taught too, with the help of a few people along the way, but essentially self-taught. I did the same thing, and, and uh, Dave Way was real instrumental in teaching me how to take breaks and come back fresh and take the, the note thing I got from Ron Fair. Um, the, um, explain to the audience how, and I don't know how it translates today because we don't use that many loops, but the process of making those records that you made, the, the beauty was not in the perfection of combining two loops or more, but it was the process of creating something that didn't exist via the rub of, of two loops. And because that, that part of time was so important to my psyche and, and music, I find myself trying to create that without loops and sometimes the client doesn't like it. But can you expand on that philosophy and how you apply it in today's world? Well, it was interesting. In the Tribe Called Quest movie, when I said uh, the low-end theory was like the Sgt. Peppers of hip-hop, I wish they had kept the next 15 or 20 seconds. Because well, what I said was, because of Tip and Ali, it was the first time, rather than one sample playing all the way through a song and just being the same, it was the first time really elaborate musical constructions or reconstructions were made from a bunch of disparate samples from very different places. And, you know, a real, quote unquote, a real musician would never and could never play that. They couldn't play it because the time feel was a little bit different on all these little snippets. And all our lives as musicians were taught to play to fit in. Mm -hmm. When I used to do guitar stuff to replace samples that people couldn't clear, I would play to the new track, to the, to the current one. And it never sounded quite right. And then I started playing to the old track from where the loop was in that yeah. time feel. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, so much stuff clicked into place. Yeah, what a great, anyway, what a great concept. Yeah, but, but that was, you know, that record for me, and Prince Paul did a lot of stuff like this too early on, where uh, samples were almost like orchestrated, where they worked together in a way that wasn't just the same loop playing over and over again. They were really complicated and elaborate uh, musical constructions. Um, the sonic issues with that were considerable um you know sonic and time wise and tuning wise you know how to make it good and in but not too good and not too in because then you lose how cool it is um so it was really uh it wasn't me you know all i was trying to do was to make it so it sounded good you could hear everything and the time felt good mm -hmm. uh at the time and the timbre felt good it really tip and ali uh, were really visionaries like that. And again, Prince Paul, there were a few other people back then doing it too. But to me, the recombining of all those elements into a, a, a really complexly orchestrated new piece was the big deal about that record. And that's incredible. I, I was, um, I, I think you and I both agree that some of the best music that's ever been made is being made now, but that time period was, was pretty special for me and for you too. The, um, the one of the things um, that, that that you referred to not only is the um, is the second wave and the first wave of hip hop, but the golden age of audio. And 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 you and I both feel that that we're in a second golden age of audio. And I get slammed a lot for saying that, not not by anybody under twenty, but mostly by people over thirty. And and it's true, isn't it? There's there's um, the, 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 the emulations of the old stuff, I won't use the word better, but they're more consistent and, and tend to they find their break. way more usable. They don't break. 
<laughs> you know, anybody who's ever owned a Neve knows exactly what I'm talking oh about. Oh, my gosh. Which, um, can I curse on this show? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. boy. That's Go great. for it. Um, no, we are. Uh, Hell the, the yeah, you can, Bob. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, in one way, we are in a second golden age of audio where people are making both emulations of the original pieces of gear that work really, really well. Don't have to change the tubes. But making new combinations of things that weren't made in the old days that are also really, really good. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is the average listener doesn't give a shit. <laughs> um, you know, the thing is, I feel like any good piece of art is a combination of a thousand tiny details by themselves don't, don't make a big difference. I wish people could say, what was, wow, what was the one thing you added to that that just made it great? It was like, well, it was, you know, the, the hundreds of hours I spent on it. Mm. So, uh, uh, with audio, it's a combination of all these tiny details that make it good. And I think that we as practitioners, I don't give a shit whether the people know the difference on the end. That's our job, is to do the best we can how we know how to make it really good. And people say, oh, man, you must hate MP3s. Well, people said the same thing when CDs first came out. Yeah. You know, good-sounding mix will make a good-sounding MP3. You'll know it's an MP3. There'll be differences from from, uh, you know, high-res audio, but, you know, whatever, it's all music. You know what, I, I, I'll take a chance and say this, Herb. Um, I have never gone back and listened to a song from my childhood and gone, man, that sounds great, I should copy that. They all sound worse than I remember them. There's something about it's, memory. Isn't that funny? It's, go that's ahead. so amazing, man. I go back and listen to stuff that is so dear to my heart, and both musically and sonically, it's it's like... Oh, wow. I <laughs> heard that. And I think two things are happening there. You know, number one, we listened in a different way in the old days. The yeah. resolution, the playback systems wasn't so acute. And also, there was nothing to hold it against. You know, modern records happen to be very precise in a lot of different ways. It doesn't mean flavorless. It means people pay attention to a lot of tiny details. So unconsciously, we've become accustomed to a new benchmark that, uh, you know, on many technical levels, not just audio, it's so much higher than what we used to hear. Um, the other thing is... I've thought about that a lot, and I realized the reason why I love mixing records is because I actually go for the sound I used to hear on those records, which is not the way they sounded. It's what I heard in my head, and it's exactly. kind of what I wanted to hear. Yeah. So Same that here. sort of keeps you going towards that ideal that never really existed in the first place. Um, but that's also a great testament to a great piece of art, whereas particularly Philadelphia kind of stuff and Motown, mm -hmm. It, it, the little bells and whistles and fine little tiny points weren't important. It was how the whole thing came together. You and I just happened to be in the place where I think we we heard everything like in the best possible light, like, oh, yeah. you know, they, it, it was supposed to be like this. Yeah. Listen to Sly, man. That, that was the biggest thing. When I got Sly's greatest hits and started listening to it again, it sounds so incredibly tinny, and it's all 3 to 5K. Now, that's interesting. That wasn't by mistake either. Sly was a radio DJ, and in those days, you listened to music a lot out of the 6 to 8-inch oval speaker in the dashboard of your car. So when you mm -hmm. think what's going to speak best on those things, it's probably between, you know, 1,500 and 4K. Sometimes I think having a mind that tends to have a better memory of the old things than, than, than actually exist helps me stay mixing because I, I'm convinced that what I mixed yesterday is incredible till I listen to it again. <laughs> um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, when you're trying to get the low end that you're known for, like Brown Sugar, uh, D'Angelo, oh my gosh, and, and some, of the, some of the root songs, and of course low end theory is, is the benchmark by which uh, there was a time when I hated you because every client was like, can you make it sound like low-end theory? I'm like, no, Bob Power can. He's a few thousand miles away. Call him, he'll do it. a good day, maybe. <laughs> but I always maintain that the reason people like you get the low-end you get is not because 
you want to, it's because you have to. That's the way you hear music. That's, it's, you don't sit there and, and invent it out of space. You get it because that's the way you want to hear it. And the tools that you use to do that become somewhat irrelevant. I've noticed that guys like you, if, if you had one API 550 in the room, you'd get great low end. If you had one pull tech in the room, you'd get great low end, one 1073, and just finish that sentence yourself for the next five days. But explain to me the thought process and you can include some gear about how you, you sit down, you're, you're, you're going in your concentric circles, and, and at some point, you, you just kick that low end in the ass like nobody else can. Give me some hope, Bob. Give me some hope that I can do that myself. Uh, my friend, you sell yourself way short. Anyway, um, the whole thing was born out of stylistic necessity. You know, coming up as a musician, doing TV scoring, doing jingles, really um, being very, very respectful of the different stylistic uh, attributes of different kinds of music. When hip hop came in, I pretty quickly learned, okay, this is one of the things that makes hip hop really cool and unique is there's massive low end and there's gradations of it. So it was more like problem solving. It was like, how do I get all these low frequency elements to work and speak well as low frequency elements and not be an entire mess and everything being bigger than everything else. Mm -hmm. So it was really, it was out of love and respect for the music that I went there in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I have a funny saying, I say hip hop has damaged me because it's completely changed the way I hear low end. And even my rock records um, tend to be what I call Whoa. tall. Um, you know, or I like when everything's represented. Uh, I don't know if I can hear 16K anymore, but, you know, all the way up to the top and all the way down to where the speakers stop working really well, which I usually feel like is high 40s for most people. Um, I think that's a beautiful spectrum. It's like having a palette of colors where you have all these beautiful colors and you work it into the painting in a really nice way. So it was born out of necessity. Uh, there were certain junctures at which I really had to work on the stuff. And it's not like, te I, now it's codified. I can I kind of understand if there, is, if there are techniques, I can understand what I do consistently. But at first it was really problem solving. It's like, wow, how am I ever going to do this? And and actually, Michelle and Ocello, who is a dear friend oh, yeah. and a, a lovely human being and obviously one of the greatest musicians ever to come down the pike, her and David Gampson, wonderful producer who's also a good friend of mine, they were bringing me stuff back then that had like two bases on it and I was always you know as a producer somebody say that and I'm like no it's not gonna work mm -hmm. so I would get stuff to mix that had a synth bass and a regular bass and having to work through issues like that as you know and then a kick drum where you want some some you know muscle on it down there too having to work through issues like that really makes you um, aware it's it's really more about uh, a sort of consciousness and an approach to listening than it is to what you do with it what you do with it is you keep trying different things until it works mm -hmm. um, but it's really more about perception and what you're listening to and you say okay identifying the elements that are there and how am I going to deal with these things because everything can't live in the same place now the old school way of dealing with it was okay Either the kick of the bass has to have the lower part of the bottom, right. part of the bottom, 115 on down or something like that. Right. Then right. the other thing can have the higher part of the bottom. It's not that simple. The, um, I noticed that also, too, during that time period in the early 90s, a lot of guys thought they had low end, but they just didn't have any top end. And if you think about it, <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell the difference between a curve. Let's, let me see if I can do it correctly. Is, is this the right way? Yeah. If, if this is my low end and this is my top end, did I boost the low end or did I cut the top end? It doesn't matter. That's both the same curve. So you can get more low end by just rolling all the top end. But you never cheated like that. Your, your, particularly your Roots records, those records are, God, it's just it's just all 52 cards in the deck. Did you ever, you know, did you ever, did you ever feed in any, any like, like 20, 30, 40 cycle tones in tune to, to get some of that stuff? Not as much as everybody else. I never got into the gated sine wave thing. Uh -huh. um, 
I probably did it a few times. I remember doing it a few times, but my thing was how can I get something like that out of what's there? And there your were weapons of choice were what? I'm not, I mean, well, there were a few tricks that we did back then, like, for example, instead of taking a dry signal and EQing the daylights out of it and have it really get pretty messy and gummy and, you know, indistinct, um, often, say, if it was a kick drum, I would bring up the regular kick drum on a fader, and it's exactly like sidechain compression. Uh, I would send it to another channel, low pass the daylights out of it, so really all you were hearing was woof, woof, mm -hmm. woof. Mm -hmm. and, and pull that in behind the regular one, mm -hmm. and then obviously high pass it just so it didn't really mess up people's speakers or take up so much room in the mix bus. Wow. Um, that was one thing. Um, okay, you know, occasionally I would actually add samples in behind those samples that were being used in the record and hiding them behind them, mm -hmm. and knowing that I could give the impression of this kick drum having a lot more bottom if I took a real bottomy 808 with no other sort of apparent um, juice in it and sneak it in behind the regular kick drum making sure the timing was exactly right and all of a sudden that regular kick drum sounded like it had more bottom. Absolutely. Hey Bob, Man. I, I got a quick question. Um, tell us, did, did, did the, your work in hip-hop inform your rock records, or your rock records inform hip-hop? Tell, tell our audience a little question. bit about how, before we get to Batter's Box, how, how that works for you. I love your as rock I, records. As I said before, hip-hop has damaged me. It's completely <laughs> changed the way that I hear low-end in music. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a really, really lovely thing. It sort of introduced me to a whole area in the in the frequency spectrum that I never really paid much attention to so definitely hip-hop has influenced me like that that said I come from a background as a working musician so when you hear music in real life um, you know everybody needs to go listen to a big band sometime man you know frequency wise it's like the richest cake you've ever had mm -hmm. everything is there mm -hmm, yeah. uh, chocolate chips sprinkles man. icing you name it yeah Woody Herman yeah I love Woody yeah. Herman so definitely hip-hop has influenced all those other things I do. Now the trick is to get as much presence on the stuff with a good fat low end because low end takes up gain in the mix bus. And, you know, if you work beautifully the mid-range, like Michael, you know, Brower is just like yeah. a master of the different shades and gradations of mid-range. And because of that, in part, his records always sound super loud because he works that area so well. Exactly. So it's, you know, once you boot up something else, you got to go back. It's, it's one of the quandaries of making a modern record. You know, mm -hmm. everything is super present. Everything has a real aggressive character. So once you go that uh, place in a certain frequency area, you end up having to go back everywhere else and make it come up to that level as well. So it's, it, you know, I also say a drum kit wasn't made to be listened to with one ear right next to the snare one ear right next to the hi-hat, one ear inside the kick. It was made to be listened to from 10 feet away. That's why mixing records is so difficult. One, one, one last question quickly. You mentioned the modern way of making records. You and I come from a live background where dynamics was everything. How, how are you, um, or rather than how, are, 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 are you concerned with keeping the dynamics in your mixes? Because your mixes still are dynamic. And they don't feel over limited to me, but they're still loud. I think that what you have to, what I like to do is give the impression of dynamics. If the arrangement is actually doing what an arrangement's going to do, you can limit it, compress it, you can do whatever you want to do unless you do it in a really ugly fashion, and it's still going to give you the impression that there's a dynamic ebb and flow to the song, even though the level may be up there all the time. You know, where it gets bad is where you start messing with what the music meant to do. Man, I'm glad to hear you say that because I, I I try to do the same thing. You want to try a little batter's box Let's with us? Let's tee it up. Batter's Let's box. Let's do it, guys. Okay. We'll just jump right in and everybody knows what's going on now. Lead vocals. 251. Ooh, good mic. Uh, background vocals. Blend. Oh. Uh, acoustic guitar. Okay, I'm 54. <laughs> Not an 84? Uh, either one. Nickel diaphragm. How's that? Okay. Rap lead. Oof. 
uh, you better have your compression chops together. Uh, <laughs> acoustic or, or a virtual piano? Whatever works. Ooh, all right, my guy. Strings, scent strings, not live, scent strings. Um, rich, silky. All right. Synth bass. Muscle. <laughs> All right. Like the main synth or pads in a song? Space. I'll come back to that one. Placement, I guess. Uh, I love your rock records. Electric guitars. That's tough. Um, I'm still struggle. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. This is a quick. Matt, what was another rock record you just finished, Matt? Matt? It begins with the M. Oh, Maktub. Yeah, I love that record. Kick drums. Save the best for last. My wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm going to edit that out and give you a chance to redeem yourself. Kick drums. Uh, you better get it right. Okay. Snares. You better get it right. Okay. This is going to, this is, th we're done with batter's box, but I'm going to kind of loosely include this. What, what do you different, what do you do different when you put something on your stereo bus when you're mixing as opposed to when you put it on your stereo track when you're mastering your own stuff? What do you, well, what's, the, what's different? Um, oh, you know, when I'm mixing, I get it to sound as good as I can at that moment. Uh -huh. And when I'm mastering, I come back and say, how didn't you cut it? How can you make it better? So you never sometimes, master immediately after you mix. You come back to it. I try. Well, sometimes. But, you know, a little bit twice is better than a lot once. So particularly with program EQ, for example, or compression for that matter, um, I will do stuff in mixing where I know it has to go a little bit farther. But rather than cranking an EQ a little bit farther, getting adjoining bands, getting more phase shift, getting harshness, I'd rather do a little bit there knowing that I need to open up the top and mastering. Why don't we um, get a, we're up against the clock, why don't we get a couple questions in from Corner Office real quick? Okay. We do uh, a so segment called Corner Office where, where we take questions from our viewers. These are some questions that our, our viewers have sent in uh, specifically for you. Uh, and Don Arnold asks, do you ever manipulate and use lower bit rates? Um, for a different tone color on something, yeah. Uh, I think if everything's really hi-fi in a track, it's kind of boring. Yeah, when, when, we, when you say you're a victim of, uh, of uh, hip-hop, I always think of the SP-1200, you know, when, when in that low bit rate sometimes. You know, uh, there's a whole genre now called 8-bit. Really? I didn't know that. Um, on Brown Sugar, the uh, the shit damn motherfucker song, Damon Jones wants to know how you got uh, the kick drum sound on that song. Or the low end, I think it was. You know, it's there's no magic trick. you got to follow the music. People forget. Music is a moving target, so you, there's no one way to get it. You know, what I did was listen to the song and say, okay, what what sounds right? I wish I could say... There's the magic frequency. There's not. You gotta. You gotta follow the music. Takes a lot of work. Yeah. Always keep your ears open. I, I said Damon Jones. <laughs> you know why I said that it was Damian James, uh, Jeremy Klein, uh, not Jeremy Lynn. Jeremy Klein uh, said that some t some people uh, the the saying um, Jack of all trades, master of none. You've managed to successfully make that saying obsolete. In terms of advice to a young kid coming along, would you advise them to take the same route you did or to tend to specialize sooner? I'd advise them to follow what they really feel like doing because that's the only way they're going to ever get anywhere with it. If, they, if they're very broad-minded and they have a lot of things, well, you can't usually do them all at once. You end up doing them sequentially. So they should go for that. Um, if they really feel like I really want to do X, Y, Z, then they should go after that. Um, 
just but as you know, Dave, um, I hate that saying that, you know, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life because we work our asses <laughs> off. Yeah, but um, it, at least it makes it palatable. Yeah, good clients <laughs> make you not notice it as much. Yeah. Bob, this is a traditional part of our show where, where we beg like uh, with no conscience for our guests to come back, and this is certainly no exception today. Is there any way you, you could come back in the future? And I know you're going to say yes on camera, but because uh, <laughs> uh, I put you on the spot. But, man, please, you know, in the future, I'd like to come to New York and maybe spend a, a, an hour with you or whatever and get you back on the show. I've learned I'm going to have to watch this episode about 20 times to really get the full value of it. But would you come back at some point? I will come back, absolutely. And everybody out there has to know, David is one of the most gracious human beings on the planet. He is the bad guy. And I'm trying to clean this up a little bit. He's the bad, <laughs> fill in the blank. Uh, <laughs> your man. Bob, yeah, thank you so Bob. much. What a pleasure. Yeah. You're one of our most requested guests ever. Yeah, and and uh, uh, we look forward to having you back, man. And Absolute I'm, I'm going to go, go help Bob with something, too, real soon. So oh, good. We'll, we'll, we'll announce that. But uh, Good. Thanks so Bob, much, Bob. thank you so much. I know you got to run to your next class. Apologize to your students and tell them that, uh, that we gave NYU students uh, of, of of Bob Power, a big shout out, shout out on our show. What's the name of the class that we that you're in, that you're teaching? Uh, it's 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 called Capstone. I teach a bunch of different things at NYU. This is a senior colloquium. Oh, uh, big shout out to those guys. Now, but thank you guys. This has okay, been a real Bob. pleasure. Love really you, man. Really thank you so much. Pleasure, pleasure. Take care. All right, bye bye. And guys, remember. Um, in our Facebook uh, contest, in our avid folks, we uh, uh, want to make sure you get to pensadosplace.tv forward slash avid. Um, you know how to enter and you know how that works, so make sure you do that. Uh, hope you enjoyed this show and let's say goodbye. Okay, guys. Um, man, I'm still, I'm still. I know, I know you guys are tired of me saying that was, that, that was, that guy really influenced me. This guy really influenced me. But these guys did. I don't know. I don't know what's different about me. But I, I really, I really learned so much from from listening to Bob's records and, and as a person and human. He's just a. He said, "I'm gracious." He's the one that's gracious. He's incredible. Go, go grab as new records, as old records. Study them, learn them, and that's a course in music and how to make records in and of itself. And when I say how to make records, I mean the full spectrum. The man writes, produces everything. So. Big shout out to Bob, and I'm, I'm heading out, guys. I'm going to go look at this episode again and again and again. See you next week.